and I misspelled effective, but that's all right. Y'all forgive me before one of my teachers points it out to me. <laughs> uh, I'll fix it. Hold on a minute here. There we go. Y'all having a good time in God's house? Amen. Thank you for coming today, and we, we want to be in prayer for the Boyd family. Continue to remember them and lift them up. Uh, also, uh, be in prayer for our little sister that got all busted up there, and that she'll get well. Uh, do we have any other sick that we forgot to mention this morning? I, I, I know we went pretty fast. Yes, ma'am, back there. Well, he knows, yeah. What's his first name? Poppy, okay. Pray for, for him. Also, Miss uh, Kathleen fell this week and broke herself up, but they didn't do a surgery, and she's back over at Ayers, but pray for her. Has some, some breaks in her, in her hip. Uh, anybody else? Pat Daniels. Pat Daniels, yes, ma'am. Is she in uh, rehab? No. Home, okay, yes, ma'am. Amanda Prine lost a loved one. Her granddaddy passed. And who? anybody else? Well, let's begin with prayer. Lord, I, pardon? Back in the back. Yes, ma'am. Miss Dottie Holmes. Pray for Miss Dottie. All right. Lord Jesus, you, you heard these call before you today. And as we come before you today and as we break your word to the brothers and sisters, Lord, I pray that I won't stumble and bumble and mess it up too much, that your Holy Spirit will be here, Lord, and you'll fill me up and... Give me the words and the wisdom, Lord, to break your word and to share the thoughts that you've given me about a spirit-led ministry, Lord, and the teamwork it takes to operate one. Lord, help us all to be close to you and help us to remember the sick and, and also those that are uh, in the rest homes and those that are incarcerated. Lord, help us never, never forget. But could you tell us, Lord, pure and true religion is when we do those things. We don't forget the poor and we don't forget those that are locked up and we don't forget those that are sick. So... We call them before you this morning. In the name of our powerful Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So many times in my life that I wanted to, to operate and do the effective ministry by myself. And uh, when we try to do the job alone, we get ourselves in a whole lot of trouble. Uh, here's a letter from, to an insurance company, and it's entitled, Trying to Do the Job Alone. Dear Sir, I'm writing in response to your request for additional information for my insurance claim. In block number three of the accident form, I wrote, trying to do the job alone as the cause of my accident. You said in your letter that I should explain that statement more fully. I trust the following details will be sufficient. I'm a bricklayer by trade. On the date of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I discovered that I had about 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than carrying the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley which was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor level. Securing the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the bricks into it. Then I went back down to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of brick. You will, no you will note in block number 22 of the claim form that my weight is 150 pounds. Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded up the side of the building at a very rapid rate of speed. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains my fractured skull and collarbone. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. By this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of my pain. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel then weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to the information in block number 11 regarding my weight. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for the two fractured ankles and the lacerations of my leg and lower body. 
This second encounter with a barrel slowed me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell into the, onto the pile of bricks. And fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I'm sorry to report, however, that as I lay there on the bricks in pain, unable to stand, and watching that empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost, my presence, lost the presence of mind and I let go of the rope. The empty barrel weighed more than the rope, so it came down upon me and broke both my legs. I hope I have finished information sufficient to explain why trying to do the job alone was the stated cause of the accident. Sincerely, a bricklayer. Yeah. <laughs> Those of you that have ever tried to do the job alone can, can kind of identify with that. But just as in Paul's day, the work of God goes on. The church is alive and well, and there are lots of ministries that are done all across this earth on a daily basis, and particularly on Sundays. All the way in California, Tracy's having service probably right now. Isn't it? Is your service at the same time? It's, four, it's two hours difference, I guess. It's 8.15 out there, so what time does yours start at 11? 10? So all across the land, though, on, in our time zones, some on that side are getting ready for church, some on this side are right in the middle of church, and men, the ministry goes on. And there, there are many people that like to work alone in the ministry. And, and it's, like we said last week, sometimes we say, you know, I could do it better, I could do it faster, and we don't want to involve people because we like to work alone. Sometimes because it's because we're loners or they're loners, you know, they don't want to involve other people. Some, some like to do it on their own and don't want others telling them what to do. They want to just be left alone and don't have somebody on their ear chewing on them and tell them how to do it. Still others work alone because no one will volunteer to help them. Did y'all have trouble when you first got to California getting anybody to help you? How many times was it just your family, sister? In those 27 years, were there ever times where it was your family alone, pretty much? We've, we've experienced that, too. And I, I shared with them last week how that when we reorganized Southside Baptist Church, when Father and Dad came back there, the first meeting on Wednesday night, when we moved back from the Cape, there was only like 30 or 40 people there, and eight of them were our family. <laughs> and, of course, it's grown since then, and thank God. But some work alone due to not having others around to help. Sometimes there are ministries that start and there's only a family, a husband and a wife and a couple of kids, or some like James Lofton that many times goes to foreign countries all by himself and not really anybody to help him. There are times when we, want, we must work alone and there's no one to help us accomplish the ministry. But the best plan is to use teamwork to, to accomplish the mission. It's better when we don't try to do the job alone. We get more done and we are, are better at it. Teamwork is the key to effective, spirit-led ministry. As we think about the scriptures today, last week we, in Acts chapter 9, if you'd like to go back there with me, we, we saw how that uh, in, Paul was in Damascus and he got in trouble and, and they were going to kill him. And he had to find some people to get him out of town quick. And remember, they led him out of, over the wall in a basket. And he escaped death because some well-meaning, good Christians helped him get over the wall. And we're going to pick up the scripture at that point today in verse 26 in Acts chapter 9. And I read from God's word. It said, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he tried to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed that he was that not that he was a disciple. Why do you think they didn't think he was a disciple? Because of why, Jim? What was his past? <laughs> he was killing Christians, you know. Every place he went, he put Christians in jail and killed them. And suddenly, he's trying to join up with them. It'd be like a, an Al-Qaeda guy carrying an Al-Qaeda flag or an ISIS flag and coming up here wanting to join our church. We'd be a little bit leery, wouldn't we? And they were real leery of, of uh, old Saul. But Barnabas took him, verse 27, and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him, and now he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of the Lord. Verse 28, and when he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem, or, and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, or, let me see, back again. They, uh, but they went about to slay him, verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified 
and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. This is in the early church, and the church was exploding in growth, and all over the land they would go and preach the gospel, and people would be saved. And, and uh, now that the, the number one terrorist had been converted, you know, the church got a little bit of, of rest. But, but then again, he was under attack. They were trying to kill him, and, and he needed some help, and he, and he really needed it quickly. When you think about ministry, think about this. Spirit-led ministry takes many forms and shapes, but almost always uses a team. God, all the way through Scripture, you very seldom, other than the work of Christ alone on the cross, almost every other time, people are working with a team to accomplish his mission. At times, it's preaching or teaching. A lot of people want to do that part, and you hear people, I want, I want to go into that ministry. I want, to be, I want to be able to stand in front of crowds and command the, you know, it, it, that, I want to be the one that lectures the girl. You know, so a lot of people want to be like Beth Moore. I've heard people say that. Bonnie's shaking her head. She don't want to be like Beth Moore, but, but a lot of people want to do that. They want to be the one that stands up in front and teaches and, and preaches. Other times, just getting materials ready for a mission trip. Uh, then sometimes it's just cleaning up after the mission trip or ministry event. The other day when we had our fish fry, it only took us about two or three hours to clean up afterwards, didn't it, guys? How many of you did some of that ministry cleaning up the other day? Stand up just for a minute. If you helped clean up after the fish fry, look at that. Yeah. Now, okay, have a seat. You, listen, when you are doing that, you are doing as important a work as, as I'm standing here today preaching. Because... When we're ministering as a team, and many times it's just doing that kind of stuff. We got here yesterday, and, and uh, right before the meal for the family at the funeral, and I got a call from Tim, and the, the cleaners usually don't come till later in the afternoon on that day, and we just missed connection with them, and the back wasn't even cleaned up. And we were going to have a meal in just a little pile, you know. And uh, so I, I said, we'll, we'll get there. I said, run to the back, Bonnie, and tell me what we need to do real quick, and I'll go back, and we'll mop it, whatever we need to do. But before we even got there, Within 10 minutes, somebody had gone back there, grabbed a mop, grabbed a broom, and they swept it out, ran the mop through there, looked fine. Now, that was ministry, you see, and it, it was a team effort. You know, we had more than one person involved in doing that. That's the way that God's ministry always works. Spirit-led ministry takes many shapes and forms, but almost always uses a team. Earlier in the same chapter, of, in chapter 9 there, there had to be some believers with some rope and, and a big basket, and, and they had to be pretty strong, didn't they, to let Paul over the wall without killing him. Kind of like the bricklayer. You don't want to just drop him, you know, and drop him over the wall. You want to let him down gently. You don't want to fall on the asphalt, do we, sister? No, we don't. But uh, without these valuable Christian workers in Acts chapter 9, the first part, there were, had never been a, a great church planter named Paul. He'd have got killed the first year of his, his salvation had it not been for some, some ministers to step in and help him. And when I say ministers, I'm talking about Christians just like you. Because each and every one of you really are ministers. Now, you're not senior pastors, but each and every one of you can minister for the Lord in, in some kind of way in the, in the local church. And God needs people just like you. Because spirit-led spirit ministry takes many shapes and forms, but it always uses a team. God made us work together and accomplish more if we work as a team. Also, the second thing, the spirit-led people salvaging ministry of, of Team Barnabas. Call it Team Barnabas. I like Barnabas, man. He's one of my favorite guys. And when you, you think about him, it's, it was spirit-led, but he was also a people salvaging ministry. I don't know about you, but the people I've been around are, I've been around a lot of broken people and hurting people. And even Christians, a whole lot of times, are not totally fixed yet. They're saved. They're on their way to heaven. But they, a whole lot of them have a lot of problems. And, but you know what? I'm thankful that there are people like old Barnabas around. Old Barnabas was in a people salvaging ministry. That's really, it's a, the church is a rescue ship, trying to keep people out of hell but, and get them walking with God. But the fact that you're a part of this church does not make you a perfect human. You know, we're still flawed individuals, and we still have problems. And thank God there are people like Barnabas around that, that, uh, that, are, that help people. The Scripture refers to him as the son of encouragement. King James says son of consolation, which means encouragement. He was an encourager, a good, spirit-filled man that was a, an encourager. And there are some Christians that are encouragers of others, and, and he was one of them. Aren't you glad there are people out there that will try to lift you up rather than tear you down? 
we have enough judgmental type people and prophets. Are, you got to have the prophets. You know, they're, they're important. We need them because they kind of keep us straight, you know, and don't let us get too far off course. But we don't need all the Christians being prophets. You know what, I'm, you know what, a, what a prophet is, right? not talking about like Elijah the prophet. I'm talking about the person with the gift of prophecy, the person that says, this is the word of God. It's black and white. There are no, there are, it's straight down the line. You know, we got to have those kind of people. But I'm glad that God puts all sorts of gifts in the body. Not everybody's a prophet. If we were all prophets, we'd probably ha have the death penalty for those that erred. <laughs> kind of like, you know, uh, Calvin did at Geneva. Boy, they put people to death that were heretics, you know. They took it the wrong way. So God puts different, differing, or different gifts in the body. One of them is prophecy of proclaiming the word and saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. But he also balances it with mercy, the gift of mercy and the gift of helps and the gift of service. And Barnabas was that kind of man. He had the gift of giving because he gave quite a bit of money. But he also had the gift of mercy and helps because he, he, he reached for the, for the downtrodden and he salvaged people. He was an encourager. There were some like Barnabas who always look at what, what a, the person can become, not what they are or what they were. He didn't care what Paul used to be. He cared what was, Paul was going to be. And he could see the potential in the guy. And even though the church didn't want him in the church, we don't want, that guy's a Christian murderer. You know, he's a, a Pharisee and he hounded us to death. And we don't want, no, he said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. This guy's good for them. He, he's a good guy. He loves Jesus. He's really saved. You need to let him, let him be a part of the team. And, and Barnabas took him on his team. And I love the fact that God has Barnabases out there. Some of you are some Barnabases. Some of you have been some Barnabases in my life. And, man, I appreciate it so much. I'm not a, I'm not a perfect pastor, and, and I never will be. Next week, when I preach the final segment of this session, it's going to be how to, how to con conduct spirit-led ministry without crashing the team. Think that'll be good? Huh? Yeah. Do you know that a whole lot of pastors crash teams? A whole lot of Christian leaders crash the team and just the way they lead. And God forbid that we ever crash our team and, and we, we fly this thing into the ground. I want to fly it to glory doing the right thing and be, being soul winners and Bible preaching and soul rescuers till Jesus comes. But God forbid that we crash the team. And Barnabas was not a team crasher. He was a, he was a, a team worker and a team builder and a salvager. Uh, there's some, some Christians that bring out the best in people. And old Barnabas was that. He was an encourager and he looked for the, the best in people. When, no, when nobody would have anything to do with Saul, Barnabas took him under his wing and, and, and nurtured him and, and discipled him. Even though Paul or Saul knew a lot about the Bible, he knew the Old Testament like in the back of his hand, he still had a lot to learn when it came to Christianity, didn't he? And how to walk with God, and old Barnabas was his key to that. When Mark was kicked off Paul's mission team, <laughs> remember? Paul, Mark, was, he left, went home, he was homesick and left the mission trip. Next time when they wanted to go, and Barnabas was wanting to take uh, Mark with him, and Paul says, no, no, he ain't going. And Mark, oh, yes, he is, Barnabas. Barnabas says, yes, he is. He's, he's, he's good for the ministry. He's going to be fine. Paul said, listen, he's not going on the mission trip. And Barnabas said, yes, he is, Paul. I think he's, he's recovered. Paul says, not on my watch. Listen, all, you, you, you compromise one time, you turn back one time, you're done. Barnabas says, listen, God, Jesus had mercy on you. Why can't you have mercy on him? Paul says, he ain't going. Barnabas says, I'm not either. And that's when Paul, and, Paul took Silas and Barnabas took John Mark, and they split company. You see, sometimes we have disagreements in churches on the style of leadership and the, and the way people are. And, and sometimes leaders can be overbearing. And over, and, well, see, Barnabas was, was not that. And he did not crash. And, and if you read in 2 Timothy 4.13, <laughs> this is funny. Paul had to eat his words. Because here it is in, in 2 Timothy, later on, he goes, oh, yeah, bring John Mark with you, with you when you come. Bring my coat and my, the parchments. And bring. He was cold. He was in that prison and uh, facing pretty much imminent death. And he says, y'all come quickly. It's getting cold. I need my coats. I need my party. But bring John Mark. <laughs> probably had to, he probably wanted to say, he probably wanted to have a, the last, before his death, he probably wanted to say, Mark, I was wrong. <laughs> Paul probably was going to have a chance to apologize to John Mark when he got there. But see, Barnabas saw the potential in him the whole time. And he, and he gave him another chance to serve God. 
And, of course, we have a book written by him, don't we? <laughs> it says something about him. Uh, Team Barnabas was, was made up of anyone that loved Jesus and wanted to serve him. It didn't matter if they were 100% super saints like Paul was, you know. They, he would take anybody that, that loved Jesus and wanted to serve him, even though they had, they had flaws. And Man, I like Team Barnabas. That's the kind of team I like to be a part of, don't you? The rescuer team. And then we look at the spirit-led, people-driven team by Paul, or, or team of Paul. Both of them spirit-led. Both of them ministers and doing what God would have them do for, in, as far as carrying the gospel out and, and ministering in that, that part of the world. Paul, the converted persecutor of the church, became the best church planner the world has ever seen. <laughs> you can't, there's no denial about how great that man was and wrote most of the New Testament. Yet everywhere he went... He met other Christian workers that helped make him successful. See, Paul could not have done it on his own. At first, he thought he could. He thought he could get rid of people like John Mark and only take the super saints with him, you know. But at, everywhere he went, he met people that helped him. He had spirit-led helpers at every port of call that made the ministry possible. He could not do it by himself. When he went to Derby and Lystra over in modern-day Turkey and Galatia, he found young Timothy. And young Timothy became an understudy and followed him the whole rest of Paul's life and, and was a, a pastor in his own right and a couple of books written to him. Uh, at Corinth in Greece, he found Aquila and Priscilla. They were tent makers like he was, and, and they teamed up with Team Paul and traveled with him. And he's mentioned in bunches of places in the New Testament. In uh, Philippi at Greece, he met Lydia and the Philippian jailer and also the, the demon-possessed girl they cast the demon out of, and, and they formed that nucleus of the church at Philippi. And, and that was his team, and, and when he would write back to them, he would write to those people that teamed up with, with Team Paul and, and helped him get the gospel out. In fact, Lydia, from what we've read, is, was a very, very rich woman, the seller of purple, and, and probably financed a lot of the mission trips during that era. Uh, when in Ephesus, in Rome, he met an Anesiphorus. <laughs> He said, nobody's with me, but old Nessa first came down here to prison and saw me. He said, refresh me so many times. <laughs> you know, only mentioned a couple times in the Bible. Yet without him, Team Paul would not have been. Without these other people only mentioned, that are only mentioned a few times in the, in the Bible. Paul's mentioned all through it, but his team is only mentioned a few times. But without them, you see, without Team Paul, he'd have never been what he was. And... and how can, we, how can we not mention Paul's other companions and fellow missionaries? Uh, Luke and Demas. You know, he says, Luke's with me and Demas is with me. And Barnabas and Silas, uh, John Mark, you know, others. See, without these Christian workers, Paul's ministry would not have accomplished and, and been as effectively. He, would, he needed a team. He had to have a team. He couldn't do it by himself. And folks, you and I, can't, we can't do it by ourselves. I can't do it as a pastor by myself. We have, we have to have a team to accomplish God's mission here. We have to work as a team. And Paul would not be what he was without his whole Paul, team Paul and team Barnabas. See, spirit-led ministry takes teamwork. It's not a one-man show. See, it's not all about Bill Keith. It's not all about Gene Keith. It's not all about Mark Shaw. It's not all about the, the children's church. It's not all about the Christian schools that we have. It's not all about... John with the Bible ministry and, and all of our Gideon ministries and all the ministries we have. It's not just about the one thing. It's the whole deal. It's a package deal. You see, spirit-led ministry takes teamwork. Many hands, the Chinese say, make easy work. That's a pretty good thought, isn't it? Many hands. In fact, when we started cleaning up, I was sure thankful we had a whole lot of people carrying tables and chairs back over here. We had seated, Trace, about 400 next door. And we had moved all of, the, all of our school chairs and tables from the fellowship hall to school over there. So they all had to come back. And you, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes, sir. 21 minutes. And just think if, if it just been Jimbo and me, <laughs> how long it would take it to show. Thank God for, for godly, spirit-led workers that will get busy and, and put their hands to the, to the work. We get more done with help than we do alone. Listen, spirit-led ministry takes teamwork. Always has, always will. Uh, when we work as a team, we all get the blessing. Man, it's rewarding and fulfilling to accomplish something for God. 
I think of, of uh, our sister making necklaces and, you know, she had to go get that stuff and make those necklaces and all that jewelry. And, and then they crashed the party. Didn't have the party they were supposed to have to, to raise money. And then, but she didn't quit, did you, sister? She didn't get mad. She says, I'll do it another way. So she had her table out there. How much money did we raise with the necklaces? $365 for the, for, the, for the building fund just because one person decided to, to, to help. And, but she had some help setting tables up probably. Did, did your man help you set tables up in <laughs> chair? So it takes a team. And then the little girls that sold the hand soaps, you know, they, they raised a, almost a couple hundred dollars. And, but it, they were working as a little team, had three or four of them. And the, and the grandmas were helping them a little bit. And they helped put a table out. You see, it, it's teamwork. When we work as a team, we all get the blessing. And we're able to do greater works. Jesus said, to, greater works you'll do than I did. That's a, that's a hard statement to think, to follow. <laughs> greater works that you'll do in your time. And, and he knew that because we have greater means and we have a bigger team now than we had back then. And we have greater ability and, and more money to deal it, do it with. So we can do greater works for him if we work as a team. And we're, li we're less likely to get discouraged. When you're by yourself, you're, you're isolated, and the devil can kind of kick you around and push you out there by yourself, and you, it's easy to get down. So, and we're also less likely to be overwhelmed. You, we see a brother or sister down, we go like Barnabas and run to them and help them, lift them back up, lift their arms back up. And we involve more Christians. Man, we have a, I can't wait for ministry Sunday in about three weeks. You know, it's going to be fun because you will get to see all of the things that we do. And I even invited, I invited Brother Jerry Nash. I said, Jerry Nash, you need to be here with your Harmony booth to tell people why we support Harmony. In the Harmony Pregnancy Center, you need to be here so you can tell people why we support you. And we're going to have all those ministries around the building and let you look at them as we talk about ministry. Because we want to involve every breathing Christian in some form of, of mission from our church. You say, I can't do anything, I'm old, I can't see, I can't get out. Listen, there's something you can do for God in this ministry. And we want to find a place for you to plug in here at God's ministry. And when we do it, we please the Lord. God, is he loves it. He says, it's wonderful when brothers dwell together in unity. He said, he said it's like the, the oil they poured on Aaron's beard and his head, and it would run down across his beard and across his holy robes. He said, that's what teamwork and harmony among brothers and sisters that are serving me is like. And that's what we want at this church. As we conclude today, Paul didn't do it alone. He needed help. He couldn't do it by himself. Barnabas didn't do it alone. He needed help. We need help too. This pastor can't do it alone. I need your help. I need your, I need your willing, able bodies to help us do what God calls to do in in. You want to join a great team? We're not perfect. We have a lot of flaws, but I promise you this. We've got a good team. Yeah. Countryside team. I like countryside team. I like working here for you guys and with you guys. It's a cool team. We have a lot going on, and we have a job for you if you want one. We'll find something for you to do here at this ministry if you want one. If you don't want one, and see, a lot of Christians don't want one. I just want to come in and have my toes stepped on every week and go, go home. And they, you know, just, just step on my toes a little bit, make me feel guilty, and then go on. No. I'm going to get more out of you than that. <laughs> okay? We're going to get more out of you than that. If you, if you sign up here, we're going to find a job for you. Get involved here at Countryside and help us change the world one soul at a time. That's what it's all about. One soul at a time. One, one home, one life, one person, one salvation a decision at a time. And we take them to, to heaven one soul at a time. And uh, thank God that we've had many, many over the years that have been here and helped. Thank God for the Boyds. They've been at this church. When they weren't in Alaska, they came back to this church, plugged in here. You know, when they went to Alaska, they plugged in their church there and were faithful there, came back, plugged in a church here. Wherever you're at, you need to be plugged into a local church like this one that's Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, and uh, Bible-following. And uh, if you're not in a Bible-believing church, you need to get out of it as quick as possible. If your pastor doesn't believe the Bible, and you're, that's the type of church you're a member of, you need to, to resign from that church. Get out of that place. Because, as we said a couple of weeks ago, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pastors in America now that are atheists. It's hard to believe in Atheist pastors, you know. And there are lots and lots and lots of the mainline denominations that do not believe this is God's inerrant, inspired, infallible word. We do. You can, I can count, tell you what we believe. So come get involved here with our church at this ministry. Next week, getting the job done without crashing the team. 
We don't want to march it into the ground, do we? We want to be successful when Jesus comes. And that the Lord will say to us, hopefully one day, like he did to your mother, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Do you want to hear him say that? Well, you got to get involved. If you're not involved, get involved. Find something to do and do it with your might. And help us do it here. We would, we, we're kind of prejudiced. We want you to do it here. Amen. How many of you countrysiders would say amen to that? Amen. amen. We, we need help here, and we need you. And God has sent you here to help us. So find out what he wants you to do and get busy, and let's get her done. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for Acts 9, Lord. A beautiful story of how Paul, Lord, was saved from death and helped and was on Barnabas' team, and they uh, just nurtured him along, Lord, and he became the great, great, great leader that he was. And his team just exploded in growth after that. But it didn't happen, and Lord, without some help. And, and your ministry here will not happen and not be effective without some help from your people. So, Lord, help us to recruit the right kind of people, Lord. You tell us in 2 Timothy 2, too, Lord, to find faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Help us, Lord, to find those kind of workers and, and get them plugged in and serve you here till you come. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never got on Team Jesus yet, Jesus wants you on his team. He wants you to be a part of his great family. And, and he tells you this. He said, if you, if you accept me, you actually become one of my kids. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe in his name. If you want to be a, one, of his, one of his kids, that's what he wants. He wants you to be one of his family members. So you come and, and let us tell you how to know him after church if you'd like to do that. What are we singing, brother? Change my heart of God. Change my heart of God. Yep. You come, oh. come and come to the front row if you have any sort of, if you want to know Jesus, come. If you want to become a part of this church, you come and just wait on the front row and then we'll talk to you after the service is over. Let's sing.